Hello, I'm Lori Halverson, substituting for Casey Aiken. This is 21 This Week. Coming up next, tip credit for restaurant servers. Is this a good idea? Will money be the biggest factor in our state elections to replace David Trone and Ben Cardin? Should Mark Elrich have created a grant program to provide funds for nonprofits? And is money the answer to solve our education crisis? Our panel of insiders will give you the story behind the story. We are joined by former House of Delegate member, attorney Marise Morales, and MCGOP Central Committee member, Stacey Sauter. Stay tuned for these stories and more on 21 This Week. In Montgomery County, restaurant servers and bartenders currently receive $4 per hour before tips, but now there is a county bill that proposes to pay these employees the full minimum wage. County Councilman Will Jawando introduced the bill last month with Kristen Mink as the co-sponsor. Jawando says that workers deserve to be paid a fair wage. Supporters say that workers will get the fair wage and patrons will still tip them. Opponents say that they like the current system the way it is and are likely to make less in tips if the bill passes. A hearing was held last Tuesday. <clears throat> Workers opposing and supporting the bill filled the room wearing pink shirts that said, Our Fair Wage, and green shirts with the slogan, Save Our Tips. Marise, do you think this is time well spent by the county council to make a change in the current wage system? Excellent question. I wouldn't frame it in that way, but I think it's important to look at how the bill would treat the different sizes of the small businesses. Uh, namely, if the, the restaurant has more than 51, the minimum wage would be $16.70. $16 if the small business has more than 50 employees, then it would be $15. And then if it's 10 or more, then it'd be $14.50. Um, that said, um, you know, we understand that there have been other jurisdictions where the, you know, they're they're getting they're getting rid of the tips. Um, the, the the tips type of, of wages, um, and we're still learning. We're still trying to figure out, you know, what does what makes the most sense. But for for the most part, um, if we have more Montgomery County residents living off of these wages, absolutely, I think it's time to look at it. Um, but also understand that we have small businesses that are also struggling. So there, you know, there's going to be a creative way to be able to legislate so that we're not putting small businesses out of business, but also not uh, creating classes of poverty in our county. Stacey, will restaurant owners be able to survive a change to the current tip policies? No, not very well, Lori. And um, Marie, Marie say I disagree with you in that I think that the learning curve has been established already, and we're looking at other jurisdictions, particularly in Washington, D.C., and this policy is not working. In fact, yesterday I spoke to Jeff Dawson, who's the owner of nine bars and restaurants in Washington, D.C. He's been doing business there for over 30 years and he said it's really had a negative impact on him on his businesses and so from henceforth he's not doing any more he's not opening any more restaurants in washington dc he's going to be going to northern virginia and is not casting an eye towards maryland because of what's going on here what happens in a restaurant is transactional it is a sales okay it's commission sales and so these servers are paid a commission based upon their performance so they have to be detail oriented they have to be able to hustle they need to know how to sell the menu and then they make more money by upselling whether it's appetizers liquor desserts and so by giving them a minimum wage you de-incentivize them and they might as well if they're just getting that amount of money be as motivated to work as a receptionist answering phones and passing out a bathroom key it's not a good idea. It's going to hurt the restaurant industry if it passes. And what's behind this is unionization. The unions came in from California to help in Washington, D.C., and there is no doubt in my mind that if they get this passed, then the next step will be from the progressive to try to unionize. And I believe that unions do represent the, the best interests of the workers. So absolutely, I don't, you know, I, I think when it comes to protecting the middle class and trying to make sure that all workers are at least getting some kind of um, increase in their wages. The, American, the average American worker has not seen an increase in the last 
40 years in terms but that of that doesn't mean that the, the, the restaurant workers should be a protected class. And say, I work in real estate sales. And so if you're making 1670 an hour, that averages out to nearly $35,000 a year. I can't go to my broker and say, I demand that you pay me that minimum wage before I sell any houses. It just doesn't work that way. If you're it's in not, a sales yeah. business, you hustle. The, the concept of a protected class, that's a constitutional uh, legal concept. That's not what we're dealing with here. If anything, the way that restaurants are run in this country is a national issue that, you know, the National Restaurant Association has lobbied for decades for the current status that we're living in. So it's, it's you know, the American way is not, and if, if you look at other countries, it's not really something that's commonplace. Um, and a lot of times, you know, it just reinforces, again, you know, the, the, the classist way that we have been able to exploit um, low skilled workers in this country. Um, so I, I disagree, but I think this is what the conversation is about. <laughs> sure, no, and I think that that feeds into the tropes that came out during the debate in Washington, D.C., that this was about slavery, that they were being treated like slaves. People choose to work in the restaurants, and they choose to work as hard as they want to to earn the tips. So I have a tip for all the voters out there, and if you don't like this and you don't want to be served up a cold plate of collectivism every time you end up going to fast casual dining instead of a fine restaurant, start voting Republican. And I, I wonder if Will Jawando or Kristen Mink were ever food servers, because if they were, I'm not sure they would be sponsoring such a bill. Um, like I was a waitress and a bar, and and I I was a um, uh, I, I I bust tables when I was in college, and I earned more than three times the triple of the triple times the the minimum wage. Um, we're just working at a family restaurant, so I I just don't think you would make that much money. Um, if you, you know, if you went to the other system, but, uh, but we don't have time to, uh, to go further on this. I think we have some good discussion. So uh, let's move on to the next topic. David Trone is abdicating his seat as a congressman to run for U.S. Senate. And this wealthy congressman and total wine and more businessman is spending money on his campaign like there is no tomorrow. He spent $4.8 million in the last quarter. He said he plans to spend upwards of $40 million to win the seat. Mara say, Unless George Soros himself runs, there is no one who can match this campaign, his, the campaign funds of David Trone. How can anyone win against him? Uh, no, and, and I agree. I think this is a problem in our, in, you know, in American politics is the ability to basically buy a seat. Uh, but we have seen David Trone uh, running in this, in this manner for other seats. Um, now, even though when he outspent uh, the other top candidate, you know, he didn't win. So just because he has, you know, he has all the cash to really flush it out and um, basically bombard all of our, you know, if you're on scrolling on YouTube or if you're scrolling on, on social media, um, you know, he, he absolutely could get folks that don't really pay attention, et cetera. But when it comes to his, um, the top candidate uh, or the, I would say the favorite on the Democratic side, um, Angela Alsterbrooks, you know, it's not just about raising money. It's also about um, you know, what that seat entails in terms of um, track record and understanding the, the needs of Marylanders. And Angela Osterbrooks has been, you know, approved politician for way longer than David Trone has. Not only, you know, is she an attorney, she's, um, you know, she's been an executive, et cetera. And, you know, you can't really ignore the fact that she is a Black woman. And it is time to, you know, that Maryland does send a woman and a, and a Black woman, a woman of color, to the U.S. Senate. Stacey, Trump's campaign donated a lot of money to special interest groups in the third quarter, such as $24,000 for Planned Parenthood of Metropolitan Washington and $25,000 to the United Negro College Fund. Is he buying votes? Is the Pope Catholic? So, <laughs> I first of all, I want to say I agree with what Marise is saying in that even though he's spending all this money on the campaign, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's the most effective candidate. But all three of us have been candidates before, and we know that there's a triangulation that happens in terms of campaign organizing. One is that you have to be present. You have to be able to get out and mix with people. The fish don't swim by your house. You have to go out and meet the voters. Then you have to have a message. You have to be on message, and you have to have the money to get that message out there. And they're all related but it takes an awful lot of money to get that message out there, as we all know. And so for David Trone, he can sort of leapfrog over the other candidates in terms of getting his message out there early and often and make himself look like the front runner. But I think that as we move into this and we see more competition, say, for example, from 
uh, Senate candidate John Teichert on the Republican side, then I think that you're going to start to see more competitive races um, coming about. The campaign for the congressional seat vacated by David Trone in Congressional District 6 is revving up. Uh, Republican Tom Royals raised the most funds for his campaign uh, in, in, in the amount of $160,383. Stacey, do you think that Tom Royals has a shot in CD6? And do you think his start out of the gate can foretell the future of the Republican primary winner? No. Um... Yes and no. I want to make one final point about David Trone, and that was getting back to the organizations that he's supporting. And so with that money, he can build up that base that he has, um, you know, he's establishing by getting that messaging out earlier. So any of the candidates that are running in CD6 would make a fine U.S. representative, and I would get behind any of them that wins the nomination. I support all of them equally right now. Where Tom Royals is concerned, he has the advantage of having a campaign manager, a seasoned campaign manager. And so, again, if you get back to that triangulation that I was just talking about, he has the ability to have somebody, as three of us very well know, when you run for office, there is just this fire hydrant of demand and information um, and expectations coming your way. And if you have a campaign manager, they can filter through what you need to know, where you need to go and what you need to do. And so Tom Royals has that advantage right now. And. So he can spend a little bit more time raising money or being present, I think, perhaps in some of the other candidates. Mariella has a good campaign going. All of them have their strengths. But I think that Tom right now, just based on the fact that he raised that amount of money, shows that he's got a good organization. Does that mean that he's going to win in the end? Time will tell. Marseille, do you see a Democrat candidate emerging in the CD6 race? Absolutely. We see that Delegate Joe Vogel has raised throughout his whole campaign, the 252,000 versus in the, in the last period, which he raised 136,000. And we also see Hagerstown Mayor um, uh, Ms. Martinez who raised 151,000. So at this point, you know, it's, it's, I think it's too early to tell, uh, but just looking at the demographics of Montgomery County and, 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 and um, the uh, Fredericksburg area, Frederick area, we understand that Democrats tend to come out um, at higher proportions than our Republican um, counterparts. So I think it's still uh, too early to tell, but it's definitely been a, a live the campaign season for the CD6 seat. Thank you. And then when we when we come back from this short break, Mark Elrich announces a grant to help nonprofits combat security threats. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Our next topic. Mark Elrich announced this week that he is creating a grant for nonprofits and places of worship. They can apply for $20,000 grants towards security if they face threats. Stacy, the total grant amount is $100,000 that is expedited and $900,000 is on the way. Do you think this is the best policy to provide security to our nonprofits and places of worship? Lori, I think that this is one important component of it, and it's one thing that I have to say I agree with Mark Elrich for looking in at the, on this and trying to take some action. My preference would be that they make tax relief available to homeowners if they want to install a security system in their own home, because this, of course, helps to divert crime and also to sell, help solve crimes if they occur. That's not going to happen. You and I both know that. And I think that because we have so much heightened security, I mean, heightened tensions around the world, we are really living some deep, dark days right now, that we have seen an increase in hate crimes. And so I do think it's appropriate to focus in on these organizations that may be vulnerable, but um, we do need to be careful about where the money is going. So I will say in this too, that the total amount is $900,000, which if you break that down by $20,000, it means only 45 organizations around the area are gonna get that kind of support. Mm. It's not very many people or organizations. Do you think any of those organizations will be approved if they're a conservative organization? Well, I certainly hope that the I will not be specifically on political leanings, except if it's a terrorist organization. I do hope that they'll, they, th this is actually being off, um, managed by the Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security in conjunction with the Grants Office Management Division of Montgomery County. That division is um, putting together or has put together a group of people that will be reviewing the grants that presumably some of them have this kind of expertise to understand, is it a real threat or not? Or are they a real threat to the public? Yeah, Mara, say, what do you think? Well, I think that the host is supposed to be impartial. That's number one. Number two, <laughs> no, <laughs> I absolutely agree with um, with the executive 
definitely we want to make sure that we are balanced in the way that we are advocating for both uh, Montgomery County residents that may have had Israeli and Palestinian family members, you know, somehow uh, been affected by the terrorist attacks and what's happening um, to the people of Palestine in Gaza. Um, I also understand that this is really more of an international issue. Um, I think that it's smart for the executive, for Mark Elridge to, you know, um, I guess, come out publicly basically saying, you know, we'll use some of the tax dollars. I think this is a, a bigger issue, uh, transcending really taxes um, and, you know, I guess, uh, putting together funds for uh, security issues, et cetera. I think this, this is really more about a humanitarian um, issue that really kind of goes beyond the county. Uh, but, you know, at, at, at the county level, um, rather than, you know, seeing him not doing anything, you know, I think that the, this is a good, this is a good first step. Well, right. actually, in closing, if I may say too, that what I would really like him to see is to be spending more money on the police department. Good, good point, Stacey. Um, next, let's go on to a topic for education. Uh, Stephen Moore, a fellow, a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation and an economist, wrote an opinion piece this week in the Washington Times about how nobody seems to be alarmed at the steady decline in test scores by our American students. He lives in Montgomery County and said he chose to move his children out of public and into private schools. Montgomery County is always successful at convincing voters to accept higher taxes so the cost of education can increase, yet we don't even have a medioc mediocrity to show for it. Mara say, MCPS used to be the best in the nation. What will it take to try something different? Excellent question. Is that the, you know, that is the budgetary question of every budget cycle. Uh, first, I would say that this is not an issue of private versus public. This is, you know, our schools are suffering in terms of teacher to um, student ratios. Um, and if you, you know, this is an opinion piece. This is not, you know, this is not a research piece. So just, you know, given that, uh, but happy to still respond to it. Um, the key word here saying being our American students. I'm not sure what he meant by saying our American students, Montgomery County is um, one of the number one jurisdictions in the country to receive uh, the most diverse students coming from you know, families of all backgrounds. I think this is a national issue where our, our, our classroom teachers are being asked to wear way too many, way too many hats from you know, doing not only the educating, but the social services piece, psychological and mental health pieces. We have a, um, a diverse, um, uh, spectrum of needs in our schools. So it's not really just a private versus public. Um, absolutely, if you know, if your if your local district school is not getting the resources that it needs and you can uh, afford to send your kids to private school, then I mean, that, that, that's a, a no brainer. This is an issue about post pandemic and making, making sure that we are, um, are respecting the profession of, of, of our educators because they deserve better. Stacy, do you have a silver bullet answer? <laughs> yes, vote Republican. <laughs> you know, and why? Listen, why? Why would that make a difference? And, well, and <laughs> I can make that pitch at the end. I just want to uh, touch on something that Marissa just talked about, and that was the pandemic. Did you all know that right now the most outstanding school system in this country is the Department of Defense? And this was reported by the New York Times on October 10th. Stephen Moore's piece came out on October 16th, and. Um, what the reporter in the New York Times indicated was that in the classrooms, there's a high level of discipline. Oh, that's a big surprise, right? And that they, they, can, they follow a core curriculum and um, the teachers are paid well enough they don't have, so that they don't have to pay for their own supplies. And this is something that Moore was talking about that is essential, he thinks, to a good education in this country. So by comparison to other the other 50 states, the Department of Defense students showed had much higher math scores in proficiency in fourth and in eighth grade. Whereas you look at the state of Maryland and it's it's dismal here, especially up in Baltimore. So one of the things that they pointed out in the New York Times article was that 85% in December 2020, 85% of the DOD schools were open during COVID, whereas less than 10% of Maryland schools were open. So we saw the damage that was done from not having classroom participation. So I think that what this boils down to, Marissa, you and I can both agree that there may be 
um, a lot of social issues that are going on. But one of the core things is discipline. So having a disciplined classroom culture where the lunatics are no longer in charge of the asylum and the teachers have more control and discipline over the students. I think that this is something that we can all agree on that needs yeah, to Yeah, I would not use that metaphor for schools. I don't believe that schools are are, are asylums. Um, but, and then going back to your point of voting Republican, if you look at the Republican jurisdictions across the country, that is where our teachers are actually losing their wages, salaries, and benefits. So I would completely disagree. Um, and in your in your example of the Department of Defense, which is not is not comparable to a K through 12 statewide program, so it's, you're not comparing apples to apples, um, but in your own statement, you mentioned that the teachers need the resources, that they need, you know, they can't be uh, losing sleep over, uh, you know, are all my kids gonna have a snack at 10 a.m.? Um, and, and the other thing, if you think about who are actually educating our, our students, our kids, it's millennials, people that look like me, people that have crippling student debt. So if you have an individual who has gone through undergrad, grad school, a master's in education has over a hundred, maybe $200,000 worth of student debt. And you're, and you're telling them that at an entry level, they're going to be making 45,000. It just doesn't make sense. So if you want, you, you get what you pay for. If you don't respect the education profession, then you're never really going to get the results that we need for a competitive workforce. That's going to lead the state of Maryland. I don't think this has anything to do with not respecting the teachers. I think this has a lot to do with the teachers' unions and how and how much control that they've got over these systems. And that's been a downfall, I think. So when you look at the core issue again and, the, and, and take discipline into consideration, then if you reinstitute higher levels of discipline in that classroom culture, you're going to get better results overall, and it'll make it easier for the teachers to do their job. And by the way, God love you for getting your teaching certificate. You'd make an excellent teacher. Why aren't you out there doing that? You went to law <laughs> school. Is that what you did? I'm not sure what you're, what you're, I, I'm not a teacher. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, you, yeah, you didn't, you misunderstood. Um, what I was going to also, uh, also say um, in terms of the unions, it, it's actually the Republican Party and every administration, uh, starting from Nixon, that has created disinc uh, disin uh, disincentive for workers to unionize, to actually stand up for their rights and have the, be the benefits and the salaries that they deserve. So, I, you know, I understand that there is definitely a um, a control issue from the teachers unions, and I and I agree with you. There has to be a more balanced policy making in terms of not just what the educator needs, but also the needs of our students. And I think that uh, the Montgomery County model is lacking in that we're not addressing all the needs of the diverse uh, student body that we have. Yeah, so one I think last we have to point. wrap it up here and uh, <laughs> parting shots next. So uh, stay tuned. Stacy, you have the first parting shot. Thanks, Lori, and thanks for having me on today. And Mar Marise, it was a pleasure to meet you, have an opportunity to discuss <laughs> some of these issues with you. Um, I think that we are faced with some really critical issues in our time. I do believe that the Republican Party has some really great solutions to the problems that we're facing. I'm a representative here of the Central Committee for the Republican Party, and I would like to encourage people to visit our website at MCGOP to find out what good things are going on. Thank you. And Marise. Just um, a, a little a little plug here. We are getting ready to roll out the East Campus for Montgomery College. And we are really thrilled to invite the participation of folks from the East County region. Um, so I also invite folks who are interested for our public forums to let us know what kinds of curriculum and what kinds of programs that are needed uh, to be rolled out in the East County. Thanks for having me, Lori. Thank you, and thank you, Stacey Amarase, and until next week. <laughs>